Okay, I'm going to go through another example. This is going to be made up example, and the primary goal here is just to show you another way to do things and show you uh, how we derive these kind of formulas. So I'm going to look at something called the long-toed salamander. And what's interesting about the long-toed salamander is that uh, as it goes through its life cycle, the tadpoles uh, will occasionally eat one another. So what happens? In terms of its life cycles, salamanders lay an egg, eggs become tadpoles, and the tadpoles become salamanders. Okay, we're going to make this as simple as possible just to go through and see what can happen here. So I'm going to greatly simplify this. In real life, uh, the timing for this is complicated and the salamanders live much longer than the tadpoles or the eggs. But let's just assume uh, what's going to happen here is say every three weeks eggs become tadpoles, tadpoles become salamanders, and the salamanders die. Okay, just make things easier and give us another way to look at things. So then uh, in terms of this life cycle though the salamanders are going to lay eggs and that's going to give us the new uh, uh, generations. At the same time some proportion of the tadpoles are going to eat one another. And I don't know what these are going to be. This is going to be the number of eggs laid by the salamander, we'll call it F. And let's just suppose that 5% uh, of these tadpoles uh, become cannibals and eat one of their can. So let's clean this up, figure out what's going on here. So in terms of our states, we have eggs, we have tadpoles, and we have salamanders. Let's suppose 80% of the eggs are viable and become tadpoles at the next uh, time span. And then for the tadpoles, let's suppose that 30% of those that survive the three weeks become salamanders. Um, and then what do we have here? We're going to have a cannibalism term. So this is going to be complicated. This is going to be 5% of the tadpoles eat one of their kin. And for the reproduction, for the fecundity, we have the salamanders are going to lay F eggs. I don't know what that's going to be. We'll make something up later, see what happens. So there's our life cycle. And now we've got to figure out what our state is. So f at time level n, so when n is 5, that's going to be the fifth set of three weeks. We're going to have some set of eggs, tadpoles, and salamanders. So at Sn plus 1, we'll have a set of eggs, tadpoles, and salamanders. It will give me the distribution at what's going to happen at that next uh, set of three weeks. So let's just make this a little more explicit. So the first entry in this vector is going to be the number of eggs at time step in. The second entry in this vector is going to be the number of tadpoles at time step in. And the third entry in here is going to be the number of salamanders. time step in. All right, so in terms of the number of eggs, at the n plus first step, what's going to happen is the only way I'm going to get eggs is by the uh, ones that are laid by the salamanders. And there's going to be f times sn of those. Number of tadpoles at the next time step is going to be what? 80% of the eggs from the previous time steps. That's the only way I can get a tadpole. And then for the number of salamanders, what's going to happen is I'm going to have 30% of the 
of the surviving tadpoles are going to become salamander. But who's going to survive? Let's see. So in terms of the survivors, I'm going to have the number of tadpoles at that previous step minus the ones that got eaten. And how many got eaten is going to be 5% of Tn. So what is that? That's going to be 0.3 times 0.95 oops, Tn. And if I multiply that out, what I found was that was, that was 0.285 Tn. So what's happening here? In terms of my next state, that is going to be what F times SN, 0.8 times EN, and this is 0.285 TN. If I want to write this as a matrix times a vector, this is a linear transformation. I can go through and show that, but I'm not going to do that here. So it's EN, TN, SN. To get F times SN, I'm going to have 0 times EN plus 0 times TN plus F times SN. To get 0.8 EN, I'm going to have 0.8 times EN plus 0 times Tn, plus 0 times Sn. And to get 0.285 Tn, so I'm going to have 0 times En, 0.285 times Tn, plus 0 times Sn. So that's going to be my T times Sn. All right. If you don't see that or don't see how I'm going from here to here, another way to do this is to say, well, I'm going to have T. Suppose I have one egg zero tadpoles and zero salamanders. According to this formula, if I have one egg, zero salamander, sorry, one egg, zero tadpoles, zero salamanders, then the next time step I should have zero eggs. I should have 0.8 tadpoles and zero salamanders. If I had zero eggs, one tadpole, and zero salamanders, according to this formula, let's see, so I've got zero salamanders, so I'll have zero eggs. Um, let's see, I've got zero eggs, so I'll have zero tadpoles, and I've got one tadpole, so I'll have 0.285 salamanders. And if I have zero eggs, zero tadpoles, and one salamander, then the next step I'll have F eggs, zero tadpoles, and zero salamanders. So if I have this T going from, since this is a linear transformation, T acting on one, zero, zero gives me my first column of the matrix. T acting on 0, 1, 0 gives me my second column. Oops, let me clean this up, make this a little nicer. Done. And then the third column is going to be F, 0, 0. And notice it's the same thing. Okay, so there's two different ways to get this. What does this mean? This means that. If I want to get my state in my or my distribution of animals at the next time step, then I can take my current st state, multiply by this matrix, so I have 0, 0, f, 0 0.8, 0, 0, 0, 0.285, 0. Double check that. Yes. Okay. Now, how do I know if the population is going to grow or decay? So in the uh, project, the first thing you do is you just pick a value for f and see what happens. Next thing you do is try to see oh, where you can find the cutoff between growth and decay. 
Why is that a thing? Well, suppose, and this is a big thing to, to, to suppose, this is not necessarily true, but if this is the case, uh, suppose my eigenvalue, or sorry, eigenvectors, span my domain, or my, my uh, range, I should say. And what is it in this case? It's going from R3 to R3. So suppose the eigenvectors form a basis for R3. That means if you give me any initial distribution, I can write it as a linear combination. Oops, that should be alpha 1 of the eigenvectors. And if I want to find S1, I'm going to take T times S0. I just said I'm going to write my S0 as a linear combination. It's alpha 1 of the eigenvectors. Since this is a linear uh, operator, I can pull out the constants. So alpha 0, alpha 1, and alpha 2 are scalar values. Oops. Now, I just said v0, v1, and v2 are eigenvectors. So since it's an eigenvector, I can write t times v0 as lambda 0, v0 from the definition of what it means to be an eigenvector. t v1, by the same token, is lambda 1, v1. It's the definition of an eigenvector. t v2 is lambda 2, v2. So this is going to be times alpha 1 and alpha 2. So let's see, so what's now S2 is going to be T times S1 so alpha 0, lambda 0, V0 so alpha 1, lambda 1, V1 plus so alpha 2, lambda 2, V2 Again, this is a linear operator. Alpha 0, lambda 0 is a scalar. So I can pull that out. Alpha 1, lambda 1 is a scalar. Alpha 2, lambda 2 is a scalar. So I can expand it like that. T, V, 0. Again, this is an eigenvector, so that's lambda 0, v0. That's an eigenvector, so that's lambda 1, v1. This is an eigenvector, so this is lambda 2, v2. So I can write this as alpha 0, lambda 0 times lambda 0, v0. This is alpha 1, lambda 1 times lambda 1, v1. Alpha 2, lambda 2 times lambda 2 v2, and let me clean this up. This is lambda 0 squared. This is lambda 1 squared. This is lambda 2 squared. Like so. And I can keep this up, blah, blah, blah. And if I do, each time I do this, I'm just going to take another power of the alphas, or the lambda. So, now I'm going to look at this distribution. If I look across here, if the magnitude of lambda 0, so this could be a complex number, so I have to be careful. If its magnitude is less than 1, lambda 0 to the end is going to decay. So the distribution associated with v naught will decay. If the magnitude is greater than 1, then the distribution associated with V0 is going to grow. Same thing here. This is either going to decay or grow. Same thing here. 
And if it's exactly one, it's not going to decay nor grow. If this is complex, you'll see oscillations, but we won't see it either grow or decay. Okay, and we can say the same thing here. So if this eigenvalue has magnitude bigger than one, we know this part will grow. If it's less than one, we know it's going to decay. Uh, otherwise, it could oscillate or just uh, stay the same. And then we can look at each of these things separately. So you have to look at each and every eigenvector and eigenvalue and decide, is this part going to grow or decay? Is this going to grow or decay? Or is this going to grow or decay? Okay. So for your uh, first part of the matrix, or first part of the project, right, you're going to have something that looks like this. Yours will be different, of course, but you'll have something. Find the eigenvalues, determine if you're going to see growth or decay, and you're going to just pick a value for f and see what happens. Right? Uh, after you do that, though, the question is, what's going to be the cutoff value for this f? For what value of f is this thing going to grow or decay? And uh, if you don't know this in advance, if you go out and measure it later, can you then just decide, is this thing going to grow or decay? Or can you predict uh, the minimum uh, fecundity that this species of salamanders is going to need in order for it to, to thrive in the environment? So it's not going to thrive if all the eigenvalues are less than one, of magnitude less than one. So you're going to find a lower bound for this so that you can then predict whether or not uh, the species is going to be able to uh, survive under the current circumstances. So how do you do this? Let's find the eigenvalues for this thing. So this is for this. This would be for the second part of this uh, part of the project. So I take a, subtract a lambda from each of the diagonal entries. Take the determinant, set it equal to zero. Uh, there's no good option here. So I'm going to go across the top row. So what am I going to have? I'm going to have minus lambda. So this is going to be remove the first column, first row. Minus zero, remove the first row, second column. plus f, and I'm going to remove the first row, second column, or sorry, third column, and what am I going to get? So this is going to be minus lambda times minus lambda is lambda squared minus zero. Okay, that's going to be zero. That's zero. I don't care whatever's there. And then this is going to be times 0.8 times 0.285 minus 0. So what do I get? I get 0 is minus lambda cubed plus f times 0.8 times 0.285. Let me rewrite this. So this says that lambda cubed is f times 0.8 times 0.285. Okay, now I've got to be careful. There's going to be three roots here. Um, when you take a complex uh, variables class, you'll figure out how to take all three of these roots. So it's not just one root, it's the cube root. But here's what's important. The magnitude of all, each of those eigenvalues is going to be the same. And the magnitude is going to be the cube root of that. So this is saying that if the cube root of that thing is greater than 1, we'll see growth. And we'll see growth in each of the three eigenvectors because the magnitude of each of the three eigenvalues is the same.
If the magnitude of the cube root of that is less than 1, we'll see decay. And otherwise, and yeah, so this is going to give us three complex values, so we're going to basically see oscillations. Okay. All right, so what does that mean? That means that if, uh, I basically need that the cube root of 0.8 times 0.285 I need that for growth. So if I cube both sides, I need this bigger than one. So for, in order to see growth, I need to have my fecundity bigger than one over 0.8 times 0.285, whatever that is. So if the fecundity is bigger than that, we'll see growth. If it's less than that, we'll see decay. The species will die out. And if it's right on that edge, if it's right equal, then we'll see it stay steady. Um, that doesn't happen in real life, right? We can't, it's very unlikely to, for it to be exactly right there. So in general, we expect to see this thing either decay or grow depending on this value right there, right? And how does the fecundity compare to that value. All right, uh, I'm going to switch over and I'm going to do some MATLAB examples and just show you how we would do this in MATLAB. But here's the thing to keep in mind. Uh, I've got this matrix. Uh, what was it? So 0 0.8, 0, 0, 0, 0.285, 0. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pick a value for f, see what happens. Um, the command to do this is going to be the eig command. Oops, we're going to call it t. And we can get the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. The way it's going to work the eigenvalues are going to be in a diagonal matrix like this. The diagonal entries of this matrix are going to be the eigenvalues. The first column is going to be the eigenvector associated with lambda 1. Second column is going to be the eigenvector associated with lambda 2. And the third column is going to be the eigenvector associated with the 3. And I want to know, is this linearly independent? And what I can do is just take the determinant of that. All right, let's call this V. And I can ask, Based on the determinant, can I decide whether or not these are three linearly independent vectors? And keep in mind, this is an R3, so if I have three linearly independent vectors in R3, I know they form a basis. Uh, and now one thing that's nice about the determinant is if these are complex valued uh, vectors, everything we've done is exactly the same and works the same. It doesn't matter. So let's go through and see how that looks in MATLAB. Okay, let's look and see how we can play this game and see what happens when we go into MATLAB and, see, and try to find how to work with these matrices. Uh, you don't have to work with MATLAB. You could work with Wolfram Alpha or whatever other kind of thing you want. You could uh, do this in Desmos if you work with lists. Um, I'm just going to show you how to do it in MATLAB just to give you an idea. So what do we have? Uh, the first step is just choose a value for your fecundity. I don't know. Let's suppose that uh, what did we say the cutoff was? Was 1 divided by 0 0.8 times 0.285. So let's suppose the fecundity is a little less than that, say 4.1. And now our matrix T then, first row is going to be 0, 0, F. Second row is going to be 0 0.8, 0, 0. And then the third row is going to be 0, 0.285, 0. So there's my matrix T for the linear transformation. If I want to find the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, so the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors are going to be the eig of T. So I have 
E and V are put in square braces there, separated by a comma. Oops, and I got that backwards, of course, sorry. This should be V and E, sorry about that. All right, so the um, matrix E, the diagonal entries are the um, eigenvalues. So if I were to look at the magnitude of the first eigenvalue, it's going to be 0.9778. So that means the eigenvector associated with 0.9778, we would expect to see decay as we grow in time. If I look at the second eigenvalue, that's E22, and I look at its magnitude, notice it's the same thing, and that's going to show me decay as well. The third, I don't have to worry about that. That's a real value, uh, eigenvalue. I can just look at it and tell, take the absolute value. It's the same thing, and that's going to show me decay as well. Now I would like to know, is the uh, set of, do the set of eigenvectors form a basis? I can merely take the determinant oops, of that set. So V, remember the first column is the first eigenvector, second column is the second eigenvector, third column is the third column vector. If I take the determinant of that, it is not zero, so that means it forms a basis. So let's see, what I have before? I said F was 4.1, what was the cutoff? It was 4.3x, so let's suppose F is 4.4 the up arrow key, and now let's redefine t to be that. So if I take the eigenvalues of that, now notice it's the, nor the magnitude of the that eigenvalue is bigger than one, so we're going to expect to see growth associated with that eigenvector. If I look at the middle eigenvalue, take the norm of that, that's bigger than 1, and I look at the th first eigenvalue, that's bigger than 1, so we would expect to see growth, uh, geometric growth with all of those eigenvalues, or so all the eigenvectors associated with that, and if I take the determinant of that V, we see that it's not 0, and that's going to form a basis. For the project, for the first um, uh, part of the project, when you're looking at the butterflies, you should be able to get a theoretical bound on the uh, fecundity. For the second one, it's going to be too complicated. And basically what you're going to have to try is just try to plug in different values for f and see where you can find the cutoff between where you're going to see growth and decay. And again, you don't have to use MATLAB. You can use uh, Wolfram Alpha or uh, any other application. Lots of other things out there will do that. Whatever you're most familiar with, that's fine. Um, if you're an engineer, though, you really should be uh, learning how to use MATLAB because that's a very common tool in the industry now. So this is uh, how you would do that in MATLAB.